This is our AIA CES approved course, The Third Tower. Solving the collapse of World Trade Center Building 7, it's about the 47-story skyscraper, which was the third skyscraper to collapse on 9-11. I'm Richard Gage, founder of Architects and Engineers for 9-11 Truth. We're a 501c nonprofit organization uh, representing a growing body of architects and engineers. A little bit about me. Uh, first, I, I was responsible at a firm in the San Francisco Bay Area for the construction documents for these three and ten million dollar gymnasiums at a local high school there, as well as the entire high school construction administration project for this 125 million dollar project. And then more recently in Nevada, this $400 million project, which I had uh, construction documents and administration, construction administration responsibilities for, a six-block project of retail and mid-rise office space, altogether about 1,200 tons of fireproof steel framing. Enough about me, though. Uh, I'm joined by 2,700, now almost 2,800, architects and engineers who are demanding a new investigation of the destruction of these towers. You're going to see why um, I'm working full time now for the last five years since we founded Architects and Engineers for 9-11 Truth 10 years ago. Uh, and there's also more than 20,000 others who have signed our petition. I'm hoping you'll do that uh, today. Uh, you will indeed receive one learning unit today for your participation in this course. Uh, those of you who are architects, engineers, or particularly AIA members, um, just uh, be sure to sign up on the uh, clipboard that will be coming around. And um, we'll report your learning units directly to the American Institute of Architects. Uh, today we're looking at the third tower. and. We have many AIA registered course formats, uh, which I'll introduce to you at the end. But you can bring this course directly to your firm, to your chapter, and uh, everybody will receive uh, one learning unit. That's uh, HSW, Health, Safety, and Welfare Learning Unit. Uh, and uh, you know, never before has a steel frame high-rise building collapsed from fire. Why then did World Trade Center 7 collapse? And this was attributed to normal office fires. So in this course we'll be looking at the manner of, of its collapse, which as you'll see is a typical controlled demolition, uh, and we'll be deciding for ourselves, is a new investigation warranted? And you'll, after looking uh, at today's course, you'll be able to describe the characteristics of building fires and the aspects of design that have contributed to make fire-induced steel frame uh, st Fire-induced failure in steel frame buildings a rare occurrence. You'll also be able to recognize the distinct features associated with fire-induced collapses and failure versus those with controlled demolition. In addition, you'll be able to describe the series of structural failures that NIST claims was the cause of this building's collapse. NIST is the National Institute of Standards and Technology who was tasked by Congress to explain these collapses to the American people, all three collapses. Uh, and, of course, you'll be able to analyze the physical evidence and dynamics of this building's collapse and according to how consistent they are with the hypothesis of controlled demolition versus fire-induced failure. So, most architects and engineers don't know about the third worst structural failure in modern history. It's an untenable situation. Uh, it should have been the most studied failure in all of, uh, of all failures. Uh, with exception, perhaps, of the Twin Towers, which you'll find there are several questions about as well. So let's get started. Here's World Trade Center 7, half the height of the Twin Towers, uh, the tallest buildings in the world at the time. Uh, but this building is not insignificant. It would be the tallest building in most of our states today, still. 47 stories tall, 610 feet <laughs> and uh, the architect is Emery Roth and Sons, the structural engineer Erwin Cantor. Uh, so we're going to look at this building today very carefully. Here it is, part of the World Trade Center complex, uh, north of the Twin Towers, Building 1, Building 2, and the low-rise buildings uh, surrounding it, all of which, of course, were damaged. Um, and this building was not hit by an airplane. Uh, 
the Twin Towers, of course, were. They collapsed in the morning. This building collapsed at about 5.20 in the afternoon. When it did, uh, it, well, before it did, uh, you can see that it is standing all afternoon after the Twin Towers went down. Uh, here in the midst of the collapse of the towers themselves. And its collapse, Building 7, was attributed to normal office fires. These are the worst fires that we have photographic or video evidence of uh, in these buildings. And as you can see, they are few, small, and scattered, which is why we have one of the several reasons we have so many questions. Uh, at 2.30, these, these fires are indeed burning on the 12th floor, and the, the fires begin to move over to the west in the afternoon. Um, yet, uh, NIST, so NIST focuses on the initiation of collapse around column 75 under the east penthouse, which you'll find collapses about six seconds prior to the overall building. So there's a lot of focus on the cause of the collapse in the final report, which came out seven years after 9-11 in May of 2002. So that's what we're going to focus on, NIST's analysis. What happened to this building? Well, they claim that these fires uh, were raging around this building the last couple of hours of this building's life. And so uh, they show these fires burning. The problem here is that the photos and the videos show that the fires were out at the time, well, an hour and a half uh, before the collapse of this building in that area. They had moved over to the west side. And so the cause of this, the, the, what they say is the fires caused expansion, thermal expansion of long span beams. Um, that could not have been happening though because the photos show, as we saw, those fires had moved to the west. So in the AE 9-11 Truth fire simulation, we show what's consistent with the photographs. NIST claiming 4 and 5 o'clock fires raging around column 79, which supports, in order to support their collapse initiation theory. What is that theory? Well, these are the long span beams that are supported by this girder, which is supported by this column. So they say, that those fires were expanding these steel beams, pushing this girder off of its seat on this column 79, allowing floor 13 to fall on 12, 12 on 10, and so on. There's a number of problems with this theory. First of all, the fires weren't even there an hour and a half prior to the building's collapse. So we could not have had these beams expanding, pushing this girder off. But let's say the fire was there. Well, they still couldn't have cause the thermal expansion because these beams are coated with cementitious fireproofing. Uh, two hour fireproofing would keep them from expanding at all. But let's say that was allowed. Well what happens? NIST forced all of the heat into these beams in just a second and a half, which forced them to expand and pushing this girder off of its seat. Well that's not reality. We don't operate like that. We want to use science that is based in reality. So let's just say that happened though and it was pushing, these beams were pushing this girder off of its seat. Well it couldn't have been pushed off of its seat because there are shear studs which tie this beam to the concrete slab up above. It can't be pushed laterally. What am I talking about? I'm talking about the shop drawings which show 30 shear studs along the length of this girder. Uh, that would keep it from being pushed anywhere. But let's say that they weren't there as NIST suggests. Uh, and then what they're saying is that these beams pushed this girder six and a quarter inches laterally. Well, that beam seat is 12 inches. But they say it doesn't have to be pushed all the way off of its seat, only halfway, because then the flange folded once it got halfway off. Well, they can make that assertion only because they ignored the stiffeners, which support that flange on this girder. These are the stiffeners. So it only had, to, they say, without those, even though the shop drawing shows that they clearly were there, uh, they, were, and they, they were then allowed to assume in their computer modeling that indeed 
this girder failed once it was halfway off the seat. That allowed floor 13 to fall on 12, so on for nine floors, where we then have the internal cascading failure complete uh, from floor to roof of this section of the building. Well, if that were to happen, we would have had massive deformation in the exterior perimeter structural steel system, which would be breaking granite panels, windows, which would be very visible on the videos. I'll be asking you to look for that when we get to the video here. So, um, and then that instability travels laterally from east to west across the building in about 10 seconds. I'll be asking you to consider if that's what the videos show as well, because were that to be happening, we would see something very different than what we actually see in what may be today our first look at the collapse of this building on the left compared to the computer model that NIST puts forth to prove their theory. There's a few problems with this computer model, as you can begin to see. It stops after two seconds. They had seven years to complete this computer model, and yet they will not show us what happens after two seconds. Uh, of course, it begins to tip over, obeying the laws of entropy, uh, following the path of least resistance, not the 40, 000, through the 40,000 tons of structural steel. So, as you can see, 400 structural steel connections or so are failing every second in order to get this building to collapse anywhere near similarly to what the video shows. <clears throat> and then this stability in the rest of their computer model shows it traveling across the west. But if this many structural steel section uh, uh, elements were were disconnecting from each other, you would see massive breakage all the way down the building. And there's only a few windows that break here and there. You'd see massive deformation in the structure, exterior structural steel skeleton. Well, let's use the scientific method. We've had it for 100 years or so in the West. We build on the body of other researchers. Uh, and so let's, let's use it today. We have a question. How do the towers come down, this Building 7, fire-induced collapse, uh, controlled demolition, all of the hypotheses are laid out, looked at dispassionately, objectively. This is the basis of science. We don't focus in on our favorite uh, theory or one that's more politically viable. Uh, we use, we use a hard, cold science. That's the idea. We do background research uh, and make observations and construct a, a guess. Uh, that's our best hypothe a hypothesis, our best guess as to what happened. Is it fire? Is it controlled demolition? We test it with experiments, analyze the results, draw conclusions. If the hypothesis is corroborated, we report the results in an open, transparent manner. Now, one example of not doing this is NIST's computer input data, which we at Architects and Engineers for 9-11 Truth have put forth a Freedom of Information request to them and saying, hey, could we see the computer input data that you used to prove your hypothesis? Because after all, this is uh, supposed to be an objective study. You spent seven years and, and, and uh, uh, millions of dollars, taxpayer money. Uh, we'd love to see that. Nope, it might jeopardize public safety if we were to release this information. Wait a minute. It would jeopardize public safety? No, it would jeopardize public safety if you weren't to release this. We are the architects and engineers who are tasked with ensuring public safety. We need this information. To, after all, there are hundreds of buildings built similarly which are vulnerable to collapse if that is the logic you're going to use. It just doesn't work. So. We're going to apply the scientific method today, and we're going to uh, uh, gather some data. How are buildings destroyed? Well, fire is certainly one force that destroys buildings. There's enough fuel in a given area in an office building to burn only about 20 minutes. Then it moves on looking for fresh new fuel sources. So when uh, a building collapses due to fire, and never have we had one 
in a steel frame high rise. But say in a wood frame building, it'll burn and fall in stages, it'll, it'll fall over to the path of least resistance, not straight down through the path of greatest resistance, especially in steel buildings, 40,000 tons of structural steel in many of these high rises. Um, so this is very important and we have lots of examples of high rises that haven't come down, I'll show you those, but let's first look at one they really tried to build and burn down with fire in the largest test in the UK, the Cardington fire test in the 90s. The way in which steel framed buildings behave in fires depends on their construction. In this test, done by British Steel in 1995, a large amount of typical office furniture was burned to see what would happen to the heavy steel beams that supported the ceiling. When steel is bare, when it heats up, uh, it uh, gets weaker. It's not that it melts in a fire. In fact, uh, the fires, normal fires, are not hot enough to melt steel. Even if you were, for example, to uh, use an unusual uh, fuel like um, kerosene, you cannot achieve temperatures hot enough to melt steel. But what happens is it starts to lose its strength. And as it loses its strength, uh, it starts to sag. It, it becomes uh, softer and sags and can no longer support the load. This was the largest test of its kind ever conducted. It showed how unprotected steel can be distorted even by a normal office fire. But as is typical in steel buildings, the structural beams only slowly and progressively warped and sagged. There was no chance of a sudden collapse. In over 20 years, um, I have not seen, until recently, a protected steel structure that has collapsed in a fire. Until recently, of course, we're referring here to 9-11, in which we had uh, not two, but three protected steel structures that collapsed. So this is very important research that we can't ignore, that we have to acknowledge as a part of the succession of of, uh, of reality-based knowledge that we've developed about skyscrapers. Also, real skyscraper fires were in Los Angeles. Three and a half hours over five floors, no collapse. Philadelphia, 18 hours over eight floors, no collapse. Caracas, Venezuela, 17 hours over 26 floors, no collapse. Not even in China, in 2009, in Beijing, the Mandarin Hotel, uh, burning uh, ground to roof, fully engulfed in flames, no collapse. On the left before, on the right afterward, slightly toasted around the edges, being put back into use today. Okay, well let's look at buildings that have fallen over, mid-rise buildings in this case, due to earthquakes. So it's an organic style, natural collapse. We have um, a building that's recognized as, at the ground, uh, but it's, it's, it's mangled, certainly, um, but recognizable as a building. It's concrete structure or steel structure, I think, in some of these, is not pulverized. It's not dis the, this, the, L, the columns and beams are not dismembered from each other. Uh, the, the concrete uh, is not pulverized to a fine powder. Okay, we'll set that aside on the shelf also as we build a criteria from which to make our comparison. These buildings were blown up, explosions. We have thick, billowing, enormous pyroclastic-like clouds with solids pulverized and a thickly defined edge of rapidly expanding cauliflower-shaped plumes due to the incredible heat from the gases, from the chemical reactions. We have witnesses that hear sounds of explosions. They see flashes of light. If you have these features, you know you have explosions. But explosions are not a part of the official story of World Trade Center 7. So we're developing a criteria that's fairly carefully defined, especially when we realize that explosions can be harnessed very effectively and placed in these skyscrapers or, or uh, mid-rise buildings 
in order to bring them down very efficiently economically. Now, there's only a handful of companies in the United States that are qualified to do this. Uh, you place these cutter charges against the steel or concrete uh, columns and beams, detonate them in a very precise order, which results in a symmetrical near free fall collapse, like you see here. So we have a body of knowledge, again, which, from which to compare. These are typical features of controlled demolition. What are they? A sudden onset of destruction, usually at the base of the structure beginning, but not always. A straight down symmetrical collapse into the building's footprint. Uh, demolition waves remove column supports. That's how we get that. A free fall acceleration, straight down through the path of what was the greatest resistance, the, four, the thousands of tons of columns in the building. A total dismemberment of the steel structure, broken up, ready for loading and shipment. Minimal damage to adjacent structures and sounds and flashes heard and seen by witnesses. Enormous clouds of pulverized concrete and heat from, from many of these clouds as well. Uh, uh, squibs or isolated explosive ejections which occur here and there obviously uh, controlled, uh, obviously explosions. And of course chemical evidence left behind in the residue of cutter charges. If you have these features, you have direct evidence of explosive destruction. Fire does not create these features, any of them, let alone all of them, we believe. So it's not going to be too difficult to compare destruction by fire to destruction by explosives, especially if we have additional corroborating evidence like government documentation, experts agreeing this is a controlled demolition at least those experts who are unbiased in their assessment and foreknowledge. So these aren't done on the spot. You don't bring a building down in an afternoon, particularly while it's burning. <laughs> so uh, we know in advance it takes months of planning and execution to, to, to bring these buildings down. We, and, and, and it's supposed to be with permission from authorities who have lots of issues like safety to uh, consider. With video documentation, this is all proof of controlled demolition. So with this model in mind, the key features of con typical controlled demolition, let's just compare that to Building 7, see if there's any of these key features. Beginning with, is there a sudden onset of destruction of this building? Well, let's take a look at the building. Uh, Dan Rather narrating for us, which may be our first view of this building collapse. The complete now, collapse. Here we're going to show you a videotape of the collapse itself. Now we go to videotape the collapse of this building. It's amazing. A, a amazing, incredible, pick your word. For the third time today, it's reminiscent of those pictures we've all seen too much on television before when a building was deliberately destroyed, destroyed by well-placed dynamite to knock it down. Well, this is very helpful information uh, from Dan Rather. Um, we have not seen this building come down or being shown collapsing on mainstream television with the exception of three or four times. Th this is easily the third worst structural failure in modern history. Why is it not a major international story and focus of study from the engineering and architecture profession and students. Is there a straight down symmetrical collapse into the building's footprint? Well, let's look from West Street. Pretty straight down, pretty symmetrical. Look at the penthouse. The penthouse drops a half a second prior to the overall. I'm referring to the main penthouse and the screen wall on the left side. That directly violates the tenant or, or claim of NIST that the collapse started on the east side with column 79 and worked its way across. We would have seen it falling stage by stage, but that's not what we see. So that's a very important point to consider uh, for our critique of NIST's theory and indeed it does fall pretty much into its own footprint. The center of the pile is in the center of the property. 
Well, I, I'm not quite convinced yet. Let's put Building 7 next to a series of controlled demolitions and ask ourselves, is there any similarity? Is there enough similarity to warrant an investigation into the possible use of explosives? Especially since it looks exactly like one, and especially since fire, the official cause of this building's collapse, has never brought down a skyscraper, ever. Wouldn't we expect that NIST would have focused almost exclusively on the hypothesis of a controlled demolition? But no. Uh, they, they focused exclusively on the hypothesis of fire-induced failure. That does not make sense when you look at the evidence that we're looking at. How do we bring a building straight down into its own footprint? Well, we have to remove the core columns, which is under the penthouse, first a half a second prior, which allows the penthouse to fall a half a second earlier. Then followed by the perimeter columns. This allows the building to collapse straight down. Any imprecision in these sequence of failures in these columns and the building will begin to fall over. So we're definitely at a point where we have to ask ourselves this question. Does fire have this level of precision? The answer clearly is no. How fast is the building coming down? Let's listen to David Chandler, physics teacher, who challenged NIST publicly, embarrassing them into an admission that the building did fall, in fact, at free fall. What does that mean? Just by watching it, anybody can see that Building 7 fell close to free fall. To measure it, I use software to track the corner of the building and compute a graph of downward velocity as a function of time. The graph had a long, straight section indicating constant acceleration. Measuring the slope, I found the acceleration to be within 1% of the acceleration of gravity for the first 2.5 seconds. In other words, the building fell through its own structure with zero resistance. Freefall proves Building 7 was a demolition, not a natural collapse. Well, we'll be looking for other proof of demolition, but regarding freefall, we can see the building gaining downward distance with every second. It fits the free fall curve perfectly. That's the definition of acceleration, increasing distance with every second. It's one of the definitions. It's as if eight stories of this building were removed all of a sudden, and the building has nowhere to go but down. How fast? Free fall acceleration. NIST actually ended up admitting this in their final report after that public embarrassment, but they do not admit the implications of this. They simply said it's consistent with our earlier research, analysis. And of course, it's not consistent because it implies, it, 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 it ignores what happened to those columns that they were removed suddenly. What can do that? Do we have a total dismemberment of the steel structure? Well, it falls like a house of cards, a steel frame, moment-resisting structure with columns welded to beams rigidly should have if it was going to collapse at all, been in a, a pile 20, 30, maybe 10 stories tall, uh, or again, recognizable as a building, as these buildings, which did fall naturally, not like a house of cards that we see. Is there minimal damage to adjacent structures? Indeed, minimal damage, that's one of the purposes or goals of controlled demolitions to not damage surrounding buildings. Do we have witnesses that hear sounds of explosions? Here's Kevin McPadden, former Air Force medic. And then it was like another two, three seconds. You heard explosions, like ba boom. And it's like a distinct sound. It's not like when the compression, like boom, 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 like floors that were dropping and collapsing. This was ba boom, and like you felt a rumble in the ground, like almost like you wanted to grab onto something. That, to me, I knew that was ex an explosion. There was no doubt in my mind. And uh, Bill Rosati, another witness nearby. 
I'm going to call in Bill Rosati. He was here when it all happened. He saw it for himself. Bill, if you can just tell us what uh, you saw, what you heard. Well, I was standing like two blocks away, and all of a sudden I just seen a big flash, and then I seen the building coming down, and I just seen people just running everywhere, chaotic like. And this gentleman, who, along with the attorney for Mayor Giuliani, walked back into the building, not realizing that it had been evacuated after the planes hit the towers. But before the towers came down, they made it up to the emergency room on the floor 23. And they were expecting to find people, but they were all gone. So they came back down, and this is their experience upon exiting the building. When we got to the eighth floor, I started walking to one side of the building. That side of the building was gone. The first explosion I heard when I was on the stairwell landing, when we made it down to the sixth floor. Then we made it back to the eighth floor. I heard some more explosions. You know, also the sound. Like a boom. Like an, like an explosion. And more than one? Yes. We started walking down the stairs. We made it to the eighth floor. Big explosion. Blew us back into the eighth floor. When we get outside, a police officer comes to me and says, you have to run. We have more information of bombs, so you have to run. Look. Information of bombs? None of these witnesses of explosions appear in the draft or final reports by NIST seven and eight years, seven years later. Uh, witnesses like these gentlemen, first responders, who hear this explosion in the afternoon of 9-11 in the vicinity of Building 7. Yeah, here's one of the guys you can tell you I'm okay, all right? Here, hold on. You want to call, oh, yeah. call your mother or something? <laughs> Why would this information be withheld from the final report? Is it important? Do we have enormous pyroclastic-like clouds? Well, the National Fire Protection Association Manual 921, the Guide for Fire and Explosion Investigation, is, is what they're supposed to be following. It is the guide. Uh, they say, look for large volumes of gas and the large amount of heat released in chemical explosions which cause rapidly expanding plumes of hot gases. That's how these are caused. And they are racing away from Building 7 after its collapse in every direction at 35 miles an hour. These cauliflower-shaped plumes expanding by what? Massive quantities of very hot temperature gases, uh, so much more heat than the few small scattered fires that we saw in this building. Where did that heat come from? That's what we're going to focus on now. And this heat is observed, measured by NASA planes, infrared sensitive cameras, which take surface temperatures. Surface temperatures of 1340 degrees which is a temperature associated with the hottest office fires we know of. And yet, there's no fire on the top of this pile. Why not? Where, what are we measuring here? We're measuring something much hotter deep down in the pile that is radiating up to the surface where it finally gets these temperatures. Well, Jonathan Barnett, of the FEMA report says steel members in the debris pile that appear to have been partly evaporated in extraordinarily high temperatures. We're talking 4,000 degrees to evaporate steel. Where did those temperatures come from? Documented also by structural engineer Abelhani, Abel, Abelhazen Astani Ozil who had a National Science Foundation this grant to study this steel. So here he is measuring um, and, and, and documenting all this steel, but he has no idea how these temperatures were achieved to melt this steel. The temperatures associated with the office fires at the World Trade Center, maybe 1,200 degrees. NIST claims 1,800 degrees, but there's, there's no evidence for that in any of their data, but structural steel doesn't melt till 2750 degrees, maybe 2800 degrees. What's creating those temperatures? We're going to be looking at a possible source called thermite, and 
we realize that something's got to be a lot hotter because these hydrocarbons, including jet fuel, by the way, only burn 600 to 1400 degrees. But steel had melted. Steel, like this steel, pouring out of the material held in the jaws of this excavator, which by the color you can tell roughly the temperature, 2300 degrees, 2200 degrees, all of which is hotter than office fires. So what's going on? What caused the steel to melt? Let's see if there isn't evidence of chemical uh, cutter charges. Well, NIST picked up this analysis from FEMA, which came out with its final report in May of 2002. In Appendix C, we have the detailed metallurgical examination by Worcester Polytechnic Institute, and they document some incredible stuff. Um, the melting of steel. In fact, John Gross, who was with the American Society of Civil Engineers early on, the volunteers, as we'll, as we'll see, the FEMA report, and on into the NIST report, he cuts off this piece of partially, in, the ends of the beams partially evaporated. Good job. His shadow is all over the evidence, but he denies that it actually occur, occurs uh, later on, as we'll see. Yet, this piece was given to, to FEMA. It was documented very carefully, as we see here. And they, what do they say? Never before observed eutectic reactions. Intergranular melting, solid steel girder turning into Swiss cheese, like this piece, which is the piece John Gross found there. Rapid oxidation, sulfidation. Where did the sulfur come from? Sulfur, NIST says, is in gypsum board. Well, the gypsum board has been used for almost 100 years to protect steel. It's never turned around before and attacked the steel it's designed to protect. And yet this is their best guess as to where the sulfur came from. Liquid iron. That is not molten steel. That is molten iron. This is different from melted steel. So it's not that something melted the steel in the pile. It's that molten iron, pools of it, were found and documented in attacking the steel. Elemental iron. Where does it come from? We haven't used iron in steel skyscrapers for 100 years. Could thermite have been melting that iron. What is thermite, anyway? An incendiary used by the military, thermite is a compound of iron oxide and aluminum, which, when ignited, sustains an extreme heat reaction, creating molten iron. In just two seconds, thermite can reach temperatures over 4,500 degrees Fahrenheit, quite enough to liquefy steel. We know that open-air fires cannot burn hot enough to melt steel, but metal had melted at the base of the towers. Appendix C of the FEMA report describes sulfur residues on the World Trade Center steel. The New York Times called this the deepest mystery of all. Sulfur slightly lowers the melting point of iron, and iron oxide and iron sulfide had formed on the surface of the structural steel. Sulfur used with thermite is called thermate, producing even faster results. Maybe we're getting somewhere here. If thermite were used, we'd have a possible source for the massive heat created. If thermite were used, we'd have a source for the sulfur. It's added to lower the melting point of steel. And if thermite were used, we'd have a source for the molten iron, the byproduct of the thermite reaction. Well, the NFPA 921 says, look for unusual residues that could arise from thermite, magnesium, or other pyrotechnic materials. NIST stated they found no evidence of explosives. Later, they acknowledge in writing that they never looked for it. You can't find what you won't look for. But others did, including Dr. Stephen Jones, who analyzed the piece of steel from this sculpture in K-1. 
Canada and finds, first of all, an incredibly jagged cut. Now this is not the cut that the iron workers at the site were using. This is an oxyacetylene torch cut. Very clean, very efficient. This is something else going on. With aluminum, the product of an incomplete combustion uh, or uh, rea chemical reaction of, of thermite, uh, aluminum. And uh, indeed, what do we find? What does he find uh, through his XEDS study? Uh, al uh, iron, aluminum, key ingredients of thermite, um, uh, sulfur, manganese, additional signatures of thermite. Whoa. Well, what else was found in the dust? all of the dust by officials from the U.S. Geological Survey doing toxicological studies on the dust. Previously molten iron spheres. Unexplained. Billions of them in all the samples. So many such that they are used as a signature component. It's not even World Trade Center dust unless it has these unexplained previously molten iron microspheres, the diameter of a human hair. Billions of them everywhere. Iron, not melted steel, again, molten iron. Where does the iron come from? Where does the heat come from to melt it? And again, where does the sulfur come from? Because sulfur is found in many of these as well. This is found also by R.J. Lee, an environmental consultant, doing their toxicological studies. Well, here's how thermite works. Slowing that down, we have thousands of these sparks. Well, what are they? Well, they're molten iron droplets. They fall. Why are they spherical? Well, the surface tension forms an aerosolized liquid into a sphere. That's what raindrops are. They're spheres. In the case of high pressure system, you're going to have billions of these small spheres which cool and fall with all the dust as a possible explanation for the toasting of the tops of all these cars surrounding the World Trade Center? What else can explain this? What rational explanation can we possibly have? Well, here's a guy, a civil engineer, who in his backyard creates a cutter charge with thermite and shows that it's very effective at cutting through steel. And it indeed cut right through. Uh, how did he do that? John Cole. He created his own cutter charge, put thermite in it, forcing liquid molten iron to cut through uh, this steel in a different piece of steel in this case. But there are much more efficient thermite-based cutter charges patented prior to 9-11, which issues a stream of molten iron cutting through steel much more efficiently in milliseconds, hundreds of milliseconds. Why would they not use C4 or RDX high energy explosives? Well, those would provide loud bangs, bright flashes. That might want to be avoided by those if indeed there was a deceptive controlled demolition going on here. What else was found in all the World Trade Center dust? Well, a team of scientists led by Niels Harrett in Copenhagen collects seven independent samples from different areas. Four of them were analyzed quite, quite detailed, and they find the same red-gray chips in all of these samples. And, uh, and there's, there's thousands of these chips in various sizes. They're red on one side, gray on the other. These are liquid applied because they're dual layered. It's like paint. They thought it was paint at first. But they find, gosh, it has the ingredients of thermite in it. Aluminum, iron, silica, oxygen, carbon. What is thermite doing in all the World Trade Center dust? They get real curious, zoom in on the red layer 50,000 times and find nanoparticles of iron oxide and aluminum powder. A thousand times smaller than the diameter 
of a human hair. Set in a bed of oxygen, silica, carbon, organic material, which is used for the expansion of gases, causing the concussive force associated with high energy explosives like C4, RDX, TNT. So we have an incendiary thermite engineered to become more explosive. What's that doing in the World Trade Center dust? This was developed prior to 9-11 by Lawrence Livermore Lab and in their studies they show that when you heat this stuff up to about 800, 900 degrees, 420 centigrade, it ignites. What does it do when it ignites? It creates incredibly hot temperatures that melt iron and leave iron, molten iron spheres, as its byproduct. Molten iron spheres with the same chemical signature as those molten iron spheres that were found in the World Trade Center dust. So we have a self-corroborating, internally consistent set of data that shows clearly that high-tech nanothermite incendiaries were used here. Well, what were they used for? As if we didn't know how these spheres were formed, they're found attached to partially ignited chips in their studies, in their analysis, discovery. This is a, this is a real problem. Uh, you know, when they decrease the size of aluminum powder and iron oxide to nano-sized particles, the surface volume is incredible. That's why they do it. And so the chemical reaction is much greater. So again, you have more explosive capability just from the size. It's a very sophisticated process, made only in the most advanced defense contracting laboratories. So we obviously have questions. We have a focus of investigation. We have, an, uh, we have criminal investigators that must be brought to bear to do their job here. Journalists who should be asking these kinds of questions. But largely, they're ignored, those who are. This is all documented in a 25-page peer-reviewed paper in the Bentham Open Chemical Physics Journal. And it stands uncontested. Nobody has provided their own set of data in a peer-reviewed pa process to challenge this work. They just say, oh, that's paint. Well, paint doesn't have these exotic properties. This is clearly not paint. Well, this is all direct evidence of explosive destruction. Fire doesn't create these features, any of them, let alone all of them. Each has to be answered in turn. What about fire? Why, don't they, why doesn't fire bring down steel frame buildings? Well, first of all, we have an incredible conduction throughout the 40,000 ton heat sink where a localized heat source like fire, even if it can get through cementitious fireproofing, two and three hours. Another reason these skyscrapers don't collapse. But even without fireproofing, we saw in the Cardington test that that heat conducts. And if it does anything, it just sags. It does not produce failure. And of course, fire extinguishing systems, automatic sprinklers, which unfortunately were not operative on 9-11, presumably due to the reportedly due to the impact damage from the World Trade Center towers when they went down earlier that morning. Maybe this building went down, World Trade Center 5, fully engulfed in fire. If any of the World Trade Center skyscrapers were going to come down, would we not expect it to be that one? Did it come down? No. Fireproof steel frame buildings don't collapse due to fires, especially these fires. Few, small, scattered. Okay, so what is the, who investigated this? Well, they started off with volunteers and right away after 9-11, these volunteers from the American Society of Civil Engineers came and um, they didn't have funding. They didn't have access to the site. They didn't have access to the drawings. They didn't have access to the steel. So FEMA got involved and they didn't have that access either 
But they got $600,000 of funding, and we'll look at that report. And we've seen part of it already. The Appendix C came from the FEMA report. NIST takes over after this report. They finally get some funding, and um, we, we, we found out what their conclusion was. The important thing here is that these individuals who started with, uh, as volunteers and in FEMA worked their way all the way through, even guiding the effort by popular mechanics to discredit the, those questioning the official story. What does FEMA say? The specifics of the fires in World Trade Center 7 and how they caused the building to collapse remain unknown at this time. Wait, you spent $600,000 and you have no idea how this building... No. Our best hypothesis has only a low probability of occurrence. Gosh, what do you do when your best hypothesis has a low probability of occurrence? You go back and find one that has a higher probability of occurrence. They do say further research, investigation, and analysis are needed to resolve this issue. Unfortunately, though, for those hoping to resolve the issue, the steel from Building 7 within two weeks was, starting two weeks, it was carted at 400 truckloads a day away from the site before forensic investigators could even look at it and shipped to China for recycling. This is the illegal destruction of evidence in a crime scene. How did that happen? Well, this was declared an act of war. So the crime scene evidence protection laws were apparently able to be avoided. Crucial evidence that can answer many questions is on the slow boat to China, showing an astounding ignorance of government officials to the value of a thorough scientific investigation. The destruction and removal of evidence must stop immediately, says Bill Manning of the Fire Engineering magazine. But it wasn't. What do the experts say? Those experts who are more objective, perhaps outside the country, like the top European controlled demolition expert, Danny Jawenko, who was shown the collapse of this building on a laptop without knowing what it was from. It was a, kind of a blind study. He says, well, it starts from below. They've simply blown away the columns. It's a controlled demolition. A team of experts did this. Professional work, without a doubt. Then he said, well, Danny, <laughs> did you know this happened on 9-11? He goes, what? And he goes, yeah, really, this is the third tower. It came down in the afternoon. No, really? And he said, really? No, really? He goes on, <laughs> it's, inc it's incredible. He says, well, they must have worked very fast. <laughs> not realizing, of course, uh, not understanding uh, the building was on fire and you don't go into building on fire and place explosives in the afternoon. It takes months to plan this. So he didn't put it all together yet. Swiss Federal Institute of Technology, uh, Hugo Bachmann, in my opinion, the building World Trade Center 7 was with great probability professionally demolished. And one of a hundred structural engineers signed on to the petition at Architects and Engineers for 9-11 Truth, Kamal obeyed a localized failure in a steel frame building like World Trade Center 7 cannot cause a catastrophic collapse like a house of cards without a simultaneous and patterned loss of several of its columns at key locations within the building. Fire doesn't do that either. <laughs> well, is there foreknowledge of this building's collapse? Again, you need permits to do a controlled demolition legally. Um, well, Chief Nif Nick Viscani knew about it. What does he say? We're moving the building command post over this way. Now, that building's coming down. And here goes seven. Wow, it came down and people started to run. Uh, Indira Singh. By noon or one o'clock, they told us we had to move the triage site. She was a paramedic. Their triage site was in the lobby of Building 7. Because Building 7 was going to come down or being brought down. What are we talking about? Did they actually use the words brought down? Who has said that? The fire department. They did use the words, we're going to have to bring it down. Well, fire departments don't bring down skyscrapers. <coughs> Something is going on here. A lot of people are confused. The firefighters are told it had structural damage, that it's going it's, it's, it's to collapse. An anonymous engineer that nobody will name apparently said at noon at, that the building has about five hours to live. 
Well, never has a fire brought down a skyscraper before. Who is this anonymous engineer? <coughs> Why did he say that? Better yet, these construction workers are walking away from Building 7, hear an explosion, look back over their shoulder at the building, then look straight into the CNN camera and say this. <laughs> We are walking back. There's a building about to blow up. All flame. Debris coming down. The building is about to blow up. Flame and debris coming down. How do they know the building is about to blow up? What did Kevin McPadden say before he said what you heard earlier regarding the explosions? He and others are held back six blocks away from the building because they're expecting it to come down. And he's listening to a radio held in the hands of a Red Cross worker. And he hears this. At the last few seconds, he took his hand off. He heard three, two, one. Do fires bring buildings down to countdowns? What is going on here? How does the BBC announce the collapse of this building 20 minutes before it happened? It's true. They actually apologize for that premature announcement, citing the confusing events of the day. <laughs> Where are these premonitions coming from? Well, have we shown so far that the hypothesis is corroborated, the hypothesis of controlled demolition? Do we have 10 key characteristic features of controlled demolition? Is that direct evidence of explosive destruction? Can fire create any one of these, let alone all 10 of them? Is there additional circumstantial corroborative evidence and eyewitness testimony and video testimony that's proof to you of controlled demolition? It certainly is to 2,700 other architects and engineers who uh, are raising these questions, who have brought us to you uh, today to answer these questions. So I hope you have indeed been challenged uh, by this stimulating information that all of us, ha as building professionals, have to internally respond to and externally act upon in some measure, according to our conscience. So this concludes the for credit portion of our evening tonight. And I, I, I encourage you to uh, sign up for credits if you're an architect or engineer. And we will report your, for, for those of you who are AIA members, we'll report your attendance directly to the American Institute of Architects. Thank you. <laughs>